Hello everybody, Justin from Stones in the Storm here. This is a recording that I made while I was on my walk and in the process of notating it in my voice recorder on my phone, I figured, you know what, there's a lot of good stuff here, I should probably post this. So here it is. This is my discussion about the emotional and logical motivational value system. So we're going to get into what motivates our behavior how these motivations reflect our values and how these values are dynamically made contact with throughout life and how our emotions help us make initial expression in contact with these values. But then as we grow and mature, we have our logical faculties available to us and eventually we need to use both of them to properly motivate ourselves and assess our values make contact with spiritual values and develop spiritual receptivity. So this is a discussion on my walk. So there's the audio quality isn't necessarily going to be as pristine as the audio you're hearing now, but it should hopefully be discernible and hopefully you find value in the discussion. So um, because it's a recording, I'll just thank you now for any contributions that you give me and stillness in the storm. It is a, reader and viewer and listener supported enterprise so thank you so much for your patreon and paypal contributions and thank you for your ad clicks that you take an interest in so with that please enjoy the recording and i look forward to any feedback you all might have in relation to these topics these are the, the kind of things i think about in my uh, off time so to speak so i'm curious to hear what you all think about this take care much love and up next the emotional and logical motivational value system, our own personal law system. So we're going to talk about the emotional motivational system and then the logical motivational system. And how the motivational system is the expression or the dynamic uh, activation of a person's value system. So let me start initially by describing what a value system is. A value system is something that exists objectively. So these values, there's a spectrum of possible values that exist as a result or a co consequence of awareness being in experience. So the fact that a person exists, the fact that they have a beingness and that beingness has a body, a mind, body, and soul creates the potential for that being to make contact with the infinite or i'm positing infinite i don't know for sure let's let's say for the moment that it's not infinite that there's a set amount of values that could be created so for example you take a person you put them into a room that is um cold likely what's going to happen is they're going to say i want to feel warm so the the state of feeling comfortable is valued and that that state of being of being comfortable is something that is a potentiality so the, the being could also say well i like being cold or i like experiencing cold in which case i would change the value but the potential both of those values exist in potential and that potential it, that spectrum of potentials is created by the presence of that being in that room Okay, so what am, I, what am I getting at here? What I'm saying is that values are a spectrum of possibilities created by the existence of a being within time-space, within a setting or context. So that's the most general definition for a value. Now, stating that, there are values that are deleterious and values that are beneficial. And we're going to make the, another premise Premissive statement, if that's even a word, permissive. <laughs> but in general, you know, what I'm getting at here is that, oh, wow. Sorry, there's a, a giant millipede dead in the road here that I did not know we had giant millipedes. That's crazy. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so there's a series of spiritual values. So that when you value something of a spiritual nature, by acting on that spiritual value, you develop spiritual skills. So, for example, altruism is a spiritual value. When a person um, sees the suffering 
of others and feels the desire to want to do something, they are that desire is giving life to a spiritual value, which is the value of fellowship. Okay. Well, these, these values are pretty abstract, and they take a lot of experience in life to make contact with. You have to actually sit and think about why you do the things you do to make contact with a, an abstract value like fellowship. For example, most people don't even recognize fellowship. They may say that they love their family, that they want to protect their loved ones, which is a type of tribal expression of the value of fellowship. But uh, the spiritual value of fellowship is different than just familial bonds because familial bonds are localized. So you say you love your fam family because they're your kin, they're your blood, they're your brother or sister, they're your father or mother, they're your cousins, they're your uncles, right? Okay, well, that, that value of familial bonding and brotherhood does give expression to the value of fellowship, but in a limited way, only in relation to your family. Anybody who's not in your family, that value won't be active because the way it's described, it's described in relation to family. So, <clears throat> for the spiritual value of fellowship to be active, the person has to feel kinship with all life. That's a different type of a value. It's described differently. And that more spiritual value takes work. Initially, we feel fellowship and kinship with our family. And this is kind of implicit. We don't even necessarily understand why, but we do. Hey, Nelly. And then... Um, As we evolve in life, and this evolution in terms of making contact with spiritual values has to happen through the agency of philosophy, so you have to actually think dynamically about your experiences, draw inferences from those experiences that trend towards coherence and in relation to being. So what I mean by that is that spiritual values are beneficially applicable to all beings. Right? So the, the value of, of loving all beings, of having spiritual fellowship, well, all beings can recognize that value. Conversely, you know, if you were, we'll, we'll take a really limited example. If you valued kinship with white people because you were white, well, that value of kinship with white people only applies to white people. Okay? So that's, that's the difference. Um, all right, so... Values are abstract, so we covered why, where values come from. They come from a, the potentials inherent within a being that are uh, made conscious through the interaction of that being in the world. So when you're in a various environments, certain values are highlighted by the, through the dynamic nature of your being. Now we've, we've covered that these values are abstract, so the way to unearth spiritual values is you have to use the tools of experience, of sorry, of analyzing experience, philosophy, in order to make contact with a spiritual value. Okay, so now, these values we can kind of explore through two different modalities. As I was mentioning earlier, we have the modality of emotions and the modality of logic. So I'm lumping all of our potential value explorations in terms of these two categories. Hold on, a car is about to go by. Come on, Nelly. Don't be chasing cars. We gotta go explore. Yep, you know. You love it. Yeah. Yeah, you're good, I know. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, emotion and logic. So, the logical mind doesn't mature initially. The emotional faculties mature almost right away. So we have biological preconditions that stimulate emotional faculties as well as consciousness conditions. So, the, so it's not just biological. There's other influences. But the way we feel, the, sorry, we maybe make contact with these influences and thereby assess our values that we're, we kind of have active initially is through emotions. So, for example... Children usually value the, the feeling of being satisfied through eating, 
So when you have eat food, and if you're very young, you're probably getting your food from breast milk, then you feel satisfaction. But, uh, oh, hold on. Hey, what's up, man? So there's two ways that we make contact and begin to explore our values through emotions and logic. And um, okay, I was sorry, I was, lost my train of thought. Was, we were using the example earlier of a baby. So a baby, there's different states of being. So these different states of being, we, they either are acceptable, desirable, or not acceptable and desirable. Okay? And when we are trying to move towards a greater state of desirability or a greater state of equanimity, of peace, contentment, happiness, we're moving towards something that we value. Okay. So that's what a dynamic expression of values are. So initially, when you're, you know, first born, you don't have an explicit understanding of your values. Your logical comprehension of what the values are, it, it's just not there. It's kind of hidden below the surface, so to speak. So the way that we make contact with this is through emotions. It doesn't feel necessarily good to be hungry. At least this is what we judge initially. But then or as a result of that feeling of hunger, we then seek food. We seek contact with our mother who will give us food from her breast. Uh, ideally, anyway, that's the best way to feed a child. And there's many reasons for that, which I won't get fully into here, but I will say that a child's mouth is highly attenuated and active. So the part of us that is the most manipulatable, the part of us that we can, we have a lot of um, we can exercise physical control over when we're born is our mouth, okay? Our sensory areas for our mouth, our, our lip, our tongue, the inside of our mouth, all of that is highly sensitive, and we have, we're focused around that. Our limbs and whatnot, they're kind of like, you know, undifferentiated. We don't necessarily know how to use them. So when you're breastfeeding, you're receiving nutrients from not only the person that is feeding you, but the person that you, you have an incredible bond with, your mother. So that experience of breastfeeding actually forms the primordial experience of intimacy, of acceptance and love and nourishment. The world is a harsh place. You were just hungry. Well, and I'm walking uphill, so I'm getting a little out of breath here, but um, the world is a harsh place, you're hungry, so that harshness creates a condition of discont uh, dissatisfaction, which then, when it alleviated through feeding, it creates a bonding experience. So suffrage, suffering, that creates the negative state, and then through that state of suffering, we then use our value system to move towards a state of non-suffering, which in the act of doing so, we actualize our personality potential. So I basically just laid out the mechanism for which all evolution takes place. And values are an important part of that. So when you're hungry, you feel hungry. This feeling of hunger is emotional, right? You don't even necessarily understand the logic behind it. But you do know what needs to happen. So even though emotions don't necessarily impart clear, coherent, logical arguments, they do give us a direction to move toward. And that direction is toward, hold on. That direction is toward states of greater equanimity. And in the act of doing so, you evolve. Now, as I was mentioning earlier, there's certain values that need to be left behind so that you can develop other ones, transcendent values, and I won't go into too much about that process. Okay, so it should hopefully be clear now that 
when your mind hasn't fully developed yet, which doesn't happen, begin happening, the process starts when you're around seven years old. The intellectual mind really begins to kick into gear at around 11, 12, 13 when puberty starts. And then it doesn't fully mature. Some studies say that in women, the full maturity of the mind and integrative emotions. So when the mind actually starts to exercise or has the potential to exercise over control over the emotional process is around 33 for women and men, supposedly 43. So because the emotional centers are active first, the way that we make contact with our values and these values are not equal around everybody. So people diff value different things because of the way the emotional biasing thing, yeah, biasing worked. So your, for example, if your um, your first few experiences in life, let's say you're a man. I mean, women get it bad, but men get it really bad too. So your first experiences are being taken out of the womb. That's when, you know, the, ideally your father figure picks you up or is the one to actually do the, the deed of birthing you. So the first face you see is the, is the face of your father. And you associate that visual image because you haven't used your eyes yet because you're just born. But you associate that visual image with the feeling the um, uh, energetic signature of your father that you've recognized and developed an understanding of and an awareness of through your experiences in the womb. And then your father takes you after the initial bonding, usually takes a minute or two, and places you in the hands, in your mother's hands, and then she places you on her chest where her heartbeat can be heard again and felt. The thing that was basically the center of your universe for nine months. So that's a proper birthing experience, as far as I can tell. Well, as uh, a lot of people know, that is not how most children are born these days. <clears throat> Men in particular, they're ripped out of the mother's womb. If they're lucky, they get maybe a few minutes on the mother's chest. And then they get, and this, is, this happens pretty frequently, so the majority of boys, I think, experience this in the world. They get circumcised. So the most sensitive part of their male anatomy, the most sensitive part of their body, is ripped from their body with no um, anesthetic, causing extreme trauma. And that, what that does is it creates a negative bias in relation to the experience of the unknown, because the birth experience is the most powerful dose of unknown, or the most powerful quantity of novelty that we ever experience in life. So how we handled that experience is going to color the rest of our lives in relation to novelty and the unknown. So if your first few hours of life were highly traumatic, which most of us are, then you have this birth trauma program that makes you fear the unknown, and that, that pangs itself up throughout life. Even people who've done a large amounts of self-work still feel initial anxiety and fear in relation to newness, and that's why. So as the mind begins to mature, a logical process begins to develop. You actually have the ability to create a representational system of your experience. And because of that, you can logically assess things in your world. You can actually make a logical assessment of what you think your values are. So for example, if you, every time you feel hungry, you want to go and eat some food, well, you have, you have enough data there to draw an inference about what you think your value system excuse me, might be. And that inference tells us that you don't necessarily value the feeling of being hungry. You value eating food. 
So the value system, what it does is it acts like the, the rule book for your beingness, your behavior, what motivates you. And the emotional values that, or the values that we find expression through emotional processes guide us in the beginning. You know, we need to initially realize that the smell of poop is kind of funky and our disgust of it helps us in us avoiding, you know, the, the risks of poop. Okay, so th there's a reason why poop smells funky to children. It's because they don't want, we have a biological imperative not to eat it. Okay. Well, later on, those, bio, those emotional values are going to start to conflict with logical values. So we may derive a lot of emotional satisfaction from eating food, but we can't eat food all the time without... Um, balance and mo moderation, or we gain weight and we start to have health issues. So what that suggests is that there's built-in blockages or hurdles that need to be overcome. So as emotional maturity begins to set in, logical or mind maturity begins to develop, and then eventually, once that faculty matures, well, now the way that we need to assess our values is not only emotionally. Come on, Nelly. This way. Nelly. Come on. Sorry. So the way we assess our, our values and navigate the world needs to not just be emotionally anymore. Like I said, the, if you're using only your emotions to guide your behavior and motivate yourself, then you're going to likely indulge in things of a materialistic order because our emotions, not all of our emotions, but the bulk of our emotions come from these biological programs that, were, that helped us grow and manifest our personality during the initial phases of life. But eventually, you're going to have to let go of these emotional motivated values to form logically motivated values. And what when happens when you do that is you discover your own lawful system. So the when we're talking about what governs behaviors of things in the physical in physics, we describe these things that govern behavior as laws. And even in the realms of men, we talk about laws as being guides for people's behavior. So the word law is actually quite applicable. So what you can think of is that your value system is your law book, the, your personal set of legal codes and statutes and, and things like this, policies that govern your behavior. And the interesting thing is that you are in control of those policies. You decide what they are or not. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that when you've decided, I want to lose weight, so therefore I'm not going to eat as much food, that you're just going to magically not feel any sensations in relation to that. The way that this system works is energetic coherence. So a logically derived value of trying to lose weight to be healthy is going to butt up or conflict against your value that you've been operating on to eat food when you feel hungry. So what you need to start to do is develop is to revalue the sensation of hunger. And on that score, I will say that the feelings of hunger, in most cases, is your body transitioning from a state of food digestion to fasting. And fasting is incredibly important. It's vitally important to sustain your body's health. Fasting, periodic fasting, helps with neurogenesis, which is the generation of new brain cells. Um, it helps with the development of coherent and stable emotional center, centers and processing. It helps you remove um, cells through apoptosis. So when you go into a fasting cycle, cells that in your body that are kind of getting old and having a hard time doing what they do, they go into an apoptosis or program cell, cell death. And then your body reabsorbs that material and it creates new stem cells to replace the ones that have been um, programmed cell death. So fasting is really good for you. So but, as we just mentioned, initially, the feeling of being hunger, hungry was something you needed to motivate your behavior so that you could have a desire to eat food. 
Okay, well now that that desire has been firmly implanted, and now that your, your mental processes are coming online, now you have to retune your value system to value hunger. All right? And this doesn't necessarily mean that the, the total store of values that you have created through emotional processes are completely abandoned. In most cases, that's not the, what's happening. What's happening is that they're taking on a different tone. So one of the things that emotions do is they motivate you, but they do it in an unconscious way. So when you experience disgust with something, that disgust feeling is your emotional faculty and the mechanism that helps motivate you to get away from something. But as your logical processes begin to come online, you can replace that program, which is, is highly intense. I mean, the feeling of disgust and revulsion is really intense. When you're feeling disgusted about something, it's hard to ignore that. It's hard to think about anything else. You know, if, uh, think about it for a moment. I'm sure everybody's had the experience of smelling defecation in their space. Like maybe if you've, you're a parent, you've smelled when, you know, when there's some poopy inside diaper, and that's a pretty apparent smell. It's kind of like undeniable. Um, or if you're a pet owner, maybe you're, you've had the experience of walking into a room and you just smell something, you're like, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure that, you know, doggy or cat um, just laid one in the room here somewhere. we got to find this thing. Okay, so disgust is, is an intense motivator. Well, here's the, the tricky part, and this is, this is actually a, um, a technique that is pretty unknown out there. I haven't really seen many people talk about this, but uh, th yeah talk about transcending disgust, but it is really important. And the reason it's so important is when you transcend disgust, you cease to be traumatized by disgusting things, quote unquote. Now, let me take a moment to say that disgusting things, what qualifies as a disgusting thing is, is largely up to the individual. There's some people that think the smell of broccoli is absolutely horrible, and they have the same reaction as if they were smelling a pile of deuce. But other people smell broccoli and they love it. So what does that tell us? It tells us that what makes something disgusting is not localized in the object itself. Okay, it's not a primary perception, to use Lockean terms. It's a secondary perception. It exists within the person. So one of the benefits to transcending your disgusts is that you develop a logical argument for why you should avoid something, but now you don't feel trauma in relation to the thing that you're disgusted by. So, for example, and this, I am not a parent, but I know this happened to me when I was taking care of my cats, you know, the, the smell of cat poop isn't so great. It's not something you want to, like, go bask in. And initially, you know, the smell was really intense. I had, like, a pretty intense reaction to it. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, I don't know if I want, you know, this in my space. I had to take care of it, like, right away. But then I was kind of toying with this idea of transcending disgust, and I'm like, well, let me see if I can use this experience and I'm, I'm not necessarily going to like love cat poop and like rub it all over my body, but I'm going to d start to develop a, a coherent logical argument for why, how I want to handle this substance in my life and so that it can transcend the negative emotions that I feel in relation to it. And it took some time to be sure. I, what the practice involved was um, sitting quietly and like looking at the kitty litter box and just sitting there and being present in the experience of the smell and trying to invoke gratitude and um, for recognizing it. And I had to develop a, a logical argument. And the argument was that I don't necessarily want to consume cat poop. I do want to take care of it and put it in its proper place. So what I realized in this exercise was that poop is actually the what we give back to the earth that helps feed the organisms in the earth to then sustain life. So it's it's what we can offer the planet. And it's in that sense, it's, it's kind of like, or it is, it's a sacred gift that we can give. So I started to think about it like that. I started to redefine how I thought about the cat poop. And after some time, I mean, the, the smell was still pretty intense. It's not like something, I, again, I, I want to experience where I'm longing it for it, but it ceased to have a really negative impact on me. So instead of having to go and clean the kitty litter box, like immediately when I smelled that it was funky, I could wait 10 minutes, then I could wait an hour, then I could wait almost all day. And what that did is it trained me to recognize these experiences that I was having, the intense smell experience, feel gratitude for it, but also have 
a logical argument to say that I don't necessarily want to embrace this as something I want to let linger in my space. It's I have developed a logical argument that allows me to deal with the substance without being emotionally battered. So to final wrap up this this discourse on our value system, the we come into this life with emotional values or the, an emotional system that allows us to make contact with our values. But the emotions well, system is largely unconscious. We don't necessarily know why we feel the way we do. We just feel things, and that guides our behavior. But then through observing our behavior, the logical system starts to come online. We can derive, create inferences that are emotionally neutral and that we can invest ourselves into and those take on a logic. So now what's the benefit to the logical system is that it's something that we can consciously examine where we don't really understand why we emotionally feel the way we do. By observing our emotions and our emotional reactions, we can develop logical arguments that then reveal to us what our values are. So we basically use a self-detective process. We're like investigators of self. When we use our logical minds to analyze our experiences, which include the emotions, to then derive a set of rules and axioms and that govern our behavior. So the, the goal here is to develop a logical value system that will become increasingly more spiritual because you've actually recognized certain values. So altruism is a, is a great value, right? Um, honoring another person's free will, being moral, being ethical, doing no harm. These are spiritual values. Well, the feeling of revenge because you've been hurt is an emotional value that's going to conflict with the spiritual value. And what you're going to have to do is motivate yourself mentally. So when you're feeling that moment of being betrayed and you want to lash out and wreak revenge on somebody, that's when you have to invoke your mental logical argument that says, well, even though I want to wreak my revenge on somebody, I actually want to main, I actually want to move closer towards the spiritual value of altruism and respect to free will and morality, and therefore I'm not going to act on this desire. So basically what I'm getting at here is that the trend, evolutionarily speaking, is to use our minds more and more. And it doesn't mean that our emotions cease to be in operation. What it means is that our emotions evolve. They become part of a guidance system now. They help guide us insofar as helping us make contact with our values. And then we can develop a rule book that it hopefully describes our values well. But in the creation of that logical rule book, we also have to recognize that our values are still relatively unknown to us. We, we're we going to explore them and investigate them, but just because you have a logical system doesn't mean you automatically make direct contact with your values. What often needs to happen is you have to make some type of premise or statement that says, well, I think my value is this. Then you have to test it by acting on it. And then looking at how you react emotionally and then looking at the coherence of that logic. So for example, in relation to the, reven the vengeance example, um, you know, you're not going to necessarily feel good by avoiding wreaking vengeance on somebody. So the emotional guidance that we're going to be getting is, in this instance, telling us that we still have programs and values for revenge inside of us that need to be worked on. That doesn't necessarily mean because it didn't feel good to not act on revenge that we shouldn't act, we shouldn't deny uh, revenge. So in other words, recognizing free will and not harming others because we feel emotionally upset is something valuable. And just because we didn't immediately feel good by not acting on our vengeance desires doesn't mean that we should go back to wreaking vengeance on people. So when I say our emotions become part of our guidance system, it doesn't mean that we're only doing things that make us feel good because that is an unconscious expression. What we're saying is that we're being we're taking notice of the sensations we feel in relation to our behaviors. And when we have a superior argument that says this is more valuable, we adhere to that as our guide. And the emotional feeling that we get in relation to expressing that value tells us whether or not we have more programming or unprogramming to do. So eventually, 
you, know, you will slowly, through adhering to this value of morality, start to feel less and less pangs of vengeance. And that increases the more you do your mental homework. So the more that you contemplate and think about and philosophize why altruism and morality are good things, and I, I won't get into all that right now, but I will say that one of the benefits to a moral outlook is that it's socially um, uplifting. You know, when you're a moral person, if the more morality that it's inside a society, the more trust that exists in that society, the more that society can manifest abundance. So it, in other words, morality literally increases the ability for people to live happy, productive lives. So what's interesting is that initially our emotions helped guide us towards greater states of emotional equanimity. You know, when the baby was hungry, it didn't feel good. It wanted to feel good, so it ate food. Well, morality is the same way, but while you're in transition, while you're just beginning to develop a moral compass, your emotions are going to kind of conflict with that sense of morality, and you're going to have to use, rely and rest on logic and reason instead of emotions. But eventually, you feel just as good acting morally as you would otherwise, and then your emotions have been reprogrammed. So that's how all this works. Hope this has been helpful and rewarding. Thanks for listening. Take care.